Feels like first round support would be pretty common here. So I think Braum or Alistair are your choices. Well, he is a great Alistair, but the Braum makes a lot of sense, right? With the Ash Arrow is the only true engage. You see Silas, and you're like, okay, he can't engage. Tom Kench doesn't engage normally, so it makes sense to go Braum and try to cut down the truest engage source on the side of Sandbox, but I'm sure the Yasuo player will be a little bit frustrated by this. And Yasuo chasing into Silas, very possible matchup here. Yasuo feels like as a kit, he can really punish the Silas and can go for an Executioner's Calling pretty cleanly, but no guarantees. We know Showmaker and Nogari can both play this pick. The band start on the red side, and we do notice a Nocturne ban. We were wondering if it would be something like Nocturne Callista or Nocturne Draven from Sandbox. They give up their Nocturne rights by not picking it in the first round, and we'll just see if Rek'Sai ends up being the choice. Remember, it's only a single target knock-up these days, but it is a knock-up synergy with the Yasuo. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I mean, very curious about this jungle pick here for Dominant Gaming specifically. Already two banned and then two more. Gragas, the obvious one alongside of that Yasuo that you could have picked up. But definitely some other picks like a Zac, a Sijuani, some of these more tankier junglers that also have knockups in their kit. I think if Punch goes on to Zac though and you're on fleek, you just say, ah, oh, maybe it's Camille time. It's aggressive pick time. It's something different is the approach. They're gonna say, go Rek'Sai, we don't care. And that's the only way to look at this because the fact that that is what Punch has been defaulting to. But Sejuani is more of a teamfight tank. They're saying this game's gonna come a bit later and the teamfighting tanks will be online and we can wait out a Rek'Sai. It's basically what Sandbox saying, maybe Onflink will be on Zac due to this game. But we'll see if anyone has a rush of blood and goes for a blind Zack. The Rek'Sai is the obvious choice. Ooh. The Jarvan is one we overlook, a pick that's been kind of overlooked by a lot of teams in Korea, but of course has great synergy with the Yasuo. Definitely one that feels a little bit higher in the mechanics column. You gotta land that EQ in order to get that knockup. The EQ flash can sometimes be tricky. The Rise definitely sticks out as a pick that was left open for a long time, banned out in the first stage of both game one and game two. And this time it just gets handed over to Duff. And it is an impression of Ergon Lissandra. There was a core duo for Sandbox, it's Ryze and Silas who can both be very flexible with lane assignments. They don't show a lot on the blue side. It was pretty clear Sandbox wanted to get a brawler. And if they go Jax, this is a legendary on fleek champion from his solo queue climbing days, much like when we think of Talia for someone like Yukal. The Jax has been overlooked by a lot of junglers. It'd be awesome to see, and we will see jungle, uh, jungle Silas considered, but most likely the jungle Jax from on fleek, so a power pick for him, and we'll just see if he goes all in on the early game, takes the Hail of Blades, and starts to make the members of Dumb One accountable in the early skirmishes. Impressive win rate so far, seven and three for that Jax, but what will be the finishing pick here? For the side of Dom1, they need probably a solo laner. The Jarvan could go top, but with this Victor, does mean it will be hitting the jungle as Victor should be heading into one of the solo lanes. Could do a lot of little cheeky flexes though, right? Could yeah. be a Silas jungle, it could be Victor in the bot lane. It's not gonna be Victor in the jungle, but I agree. You need some magic damage from somewhere, so understandable that we end up with this Victor top lane. Imagine Summit's gonna want to brawl, but he can't go for magic resist and be fine. He's against a Yasuo, and the lane assignments will evolve based on the early game. Jarvan, we'll see if it's Cinderhulk or Warrior. Cinderhulk, Jar Jarvan, a big pick over in the LPL right now, and should increasingly rise up in priority in Korea. Kind of forced in this game with all the jungle bans. We get the draft here, and you gotta say, the gift wrapping of the Lucian in trade for a first pick Silas is what people are ready to shout about in the post game thread. So let's see if we can understand the Silas priority, especially given it starts this game zero and two on the day. Yeah, you generally think, hey, maybe pick Silas for some good ults, but we see it picked earlier rather than later a lot more often. So you just have to take the ults that are given to you essentially by the enemy team. And it looks like Summit going to be heading back onto that Silas for a second time. So we'll see if he can grab a win with this one this time around. Very balanced draft from the side of Sandbox around that though. Early power, the Tom Kench Ash in order to spot out there. So there's still a draft that can win, but I understand your frustration and cynicism about the Silas. Go on the other side and down one, got a lot of big tier list picks. Showmaker ends up being the Yasuo player. If he puts on a show here, that could definitely be Dumb One Gaming upsetting Sandbox and continue what would then be a seven-match win streak in the LCK.
that it would as it's not the Katarina, but it's another one to show off his skill. We'll see if he can do it here in game number three of Sandbox versus Stomp. Head on to the rift now for game number three. We mentioned how Showmaker, definitely one of these guys in the new mid meta, loves to pop off. He put on a fantastic Zoe performance in game number two, and he's going to try to carry his team once again with a very early pick. Second picked here, Yasuo in game three. It's a very early sign. That's actually an early advantage down one gaming, but the point I wanted to get to is a very early sign that Onfleek is looking to carry his team because notice it is not Hail of Blades. Conqueror Jax from the jungle coming in. Of course, junglers didn't get the old value of the Conqueror, practically on minions and then having to stack it up on champions. They were entering late. So it is very much about extended fights around the Jax and he can proc it very quickly with an auto attack cancel, diving in with his QE. Looking at the win rates here again, Onfleek, a very notable Jax player. And that's going to be the most interesting thing to me because Jack's jungle has threat that only Jarvan can really emulate, right? When it comes to level two, level three, he can ward jump with his Q and have an AOE stun from it as early as level two. So he can find very creative ways to path that Jarvan and Rek'Sai and the other champions have seen recently can emulate, but I think Jack's just the theoretical maximum is really high. So I'm very excited to see his pathing. So far, he started on red buff, and he's really feeling like he wants that early Raptor. So that early Rift Skull. Yeah. We're taking a look at the bottom lane here. We saw the Ash in response to the Lucian. You know, you consider some of the other, other lanes that uh, usually struggle up against the Lucian, the Ezreal, uh, very commonly struggling in solo queue. But Ash picked early, especially at level one after the dash was taken by Nuclear, just able to out-push him and out-range him and out-trade, especially at level one. So looking good so far for the Ash. Look at the rune choices here in the Silas versus Victor matchup. Nothing too surprising, extra healing at the end of the resolve tree there and Transcendence. Meanwhile, shield bash onto Nogari for Q trades. We'll see if it ends up being Q max uh, to kind of complement that. A lot of Summit's winning trades are pretty predictable, so you would imagine you would get a Q auto trade in there. Showmaker actually showed he had a Rift Scuttle spotting war, but that wasn't too surprising, right? It's an early level one ward when he queued randomly towards the brush that Jax was in. But he was some pressure though. His punch wants to take down some Raptors. Probably not the best at taking down Raptors without the Talisman, so we'll take some damage from the Raptors. Still good to steal away the majority of them leaves. A little guy, as you can see, is not going to rubber band that one just yet. Comes down and says, hey, I can steal the Krugs too. As the Jax is still in the top side of the map. A bit of a trade of positions of power. Hopefully not revealed just yet, but definitely confirms him. That's a visual bug. By the way, he's still in the brush. And, uh, well... Maybe it wasn't a visual bug. Maybe he disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> Drops through the map. Yeah. I mean, stranger things have happened on Summoner's Rift. What's your favorite bug during your time of watching and playing League of Legends? I was a huge fan of Cho'Gath knocking people out of the Rift with his Q. You remember when the knock-up would sometimes just oh, yeah. extra stun yeah, them as yeah. they just popped through to the air? I, li I like the skating Shelly. Uh, it's definitely a big one for me. I like how she kind of just slides into the turret. Looks really dumb. Speaking of dumb reasons to pause game, it seems like a mouse driver's issue. That's a kind of strange one to crop up in the middle of the game. I guess the Razer logo came up there and it said <laughs> update, and they're like, oh no! Yeah. So Snafu, we don't actually know what, what type of mice. Actually, it says Logitech, so shout out to Logitech. You had, you had to call Great them mice. out there. Yeah. <laughs> we call out the good things, got to call out the bad things. We're balanced over here True. on the LCK. Speaking of good things, we haven't had many of these issues so far in spring 2019. Podcast has been delayed many times. The Papa Valdez podcast is back. Sandbox gaming fans coming through here. So favorite bug that you've enjoyed was, uh, was the last thing we were at. Hey, it's Nogari. There he is. He's waving, as you can see. Nogari is Korean for Raccoon. So that's the uh, the thing there. We've explained it many times. We always have new viewers over here. We get to look around at some of the great handiwork of our 
Pretty full house here, looking around. We're about 80%, 85% full today for Sandbox versus Dom 1. Two challengers teams, so on a different season, if these two teams are struggling, could have been a mostly empty low park. But looking around, people are appreciating the fact that these guys are top five, and there's something to like about both Sandbox and Dom 1 game. That there is, as we saw, a sign there for Nuggery, and then a sign there for Summit. That is the top lane matchup. Now, could you translate the left sign, please? What does that one say? Show make your love. Ah, thank yeah. you for that one. You're Korean you, you could, on point. You could get confused and think it's heart, but it actually means love at thank the bottom you. there. So just in case you guys were wondering. That's what we pay the big bucks for about us. Yeah, that's why I'm here, actually, just my Korean translation skill. Well, Showmaker's here for his outplay gone. It wasn't true in the first round, Robin. Again, he just... The Lissandra Galli or Urgot meta that, say, SKT were taking to, it just really didn't suit Dom1 Gaming. So it's nice to see him find something else. The Flame fans, of course, are multiplying now that he's back in the LCK. He's been a fan since 2013 of Flame. She's been around a long time, and so has Flame. There are the Korean casters on the right. <laughs> The old boys. That's ambition on the right. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. Yep. Definitely seeing some CJ Entis. But that's a very old CJ Entis uh, support flag. I have one of those in my house. So. Wow. Shout out to the fan for bringing that one out. That's definitely super OG. Cool to see. Do you have a lot of esports uh, paraphernalia? What have you siphoned away? I even actually from the, don't. I, I even have... from the StarCraft days, have you been able to? Because, of course, a lot of these orgs were around since the StarCraft 1 and 2 days over here. I think I have a couple of Pro League stuff from, you know, when I first started casting 2012. But overall, not too much. That says Spain and Korean, actually. Nice. Right underneath the Spanish flag. Global fan. In the audience, there, Sandbox fans. It's cool to see global fans, not just going with the legacy players. Can you uh, can you translate the Spanish there on the bottom left there, Papa Smith? No, if it was that's your job. If it was French, I would have had a chance. But uh, I mean, they're close enough, right? Uh, yeah, they're basically <laughs> the same, right? Down one gaming fans here. A lot of fan signs around. People feeling good as we're getting the pause. We'll get an update to you guys as soon as we understand it. I don't think it was visual bug right. Again, we think it's a mouse driver issue. Yeah. Looking for that seventh win in a row. CJ is actually an important thing to discuss today because our second series of the day is Jinair Green Wings. Jinair on a 17-game losing streak is actually equal the longest of all time. That was CJ Entis in summer of 2016. If you're just a newer viewer of the LCK, you joined in 2017 or 2018. By the way, Monty Doe with the best. But more importantly, <laughs> what you should know about is that... Uh, CJ's roster, if you look at it now with your hindsight goggles on, it's unbelievable that that team was 0 and 17. Because that team, if you remember, was Untara top lane. And then you say, but Papa Smithy, I don't know about Untara. Okay, let me keep going. Uh, jungle was Haru, who of course, is a world champion on Samsung Galaxy in 2017. Mid laner BDD, AD carry yeah. Kramer, who's popping off off of LGD. Shout out to Kramer. He's actually having a great season over in the LPL, and of course, was a finalist in LCK Spring last year. Mm -hmm. And the support was Mad Life, you know, one of the greatest support of all time. So it's insane that that lineup was 0 and 17, but maybe we'll be saying the same thing about Jinair's players in 2021 if they find success on future teams. But right now, Jinair looking to create a new record. They've already emulated that CJ 2016 summer team. Who's to say how far Jinair can go? Because if we believe in one thing about Jin Air, it's setting the wrong type of records this season. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, always unfortunate to talk about, but we will have to talk about that in our second series of the night. But before we do get there, we have a gank that could happen if Nuggery does get a little bit too far forward in this lane on Fleek, waiting for it. Here he comes. Summit is going to land that knockup. When do you flash his Nuggery? Let's watch. Okay, stun comes in. Nice little stun field here from Nuggery. He's able to tank wow. up a bunch of that he damage. He swag walks yeah. out of it as well. The question was, when do you flash? Not if you flash, but the W timing there was just a thing of beauty. I, I don't know if we'll get a replay, but I would love to see a replay of how that happened. I guess on Fleek messed up in working out when to gap close and just walked in and got stunned early, but there's... No world where you should get away from that gank with no flash. Especially as the victor, I suppose Silas and the Jax not able to do enough damage, and it was really well played 
by the side of Nuggery. What a swag walk, though. I mean, remember we're on the swag walk patch where we got obese Gragas, like, <laughs> stifling around, twisted fate yeah. with a, a very weird posture. He already had the old man Kane for a long time, and he just swag walked out. Really nicely done by Nuggery, and that means he can play Nuggery style and push up and not worry about the next gank. He's got flash left over for that one. I blame Silas. <laughs> I mean, as you know, it was his lane that it failed in. See, I'm worried though, because you're really kicking a man when he's down. Silas is really down in the LCK and down in this series, 0 and 2. I have a suspicion that when you play solo queue, I'm going to check your solo queue VODs from your stream uh -huh. and confirm this. I bet you, when you make a fail, you tab over and you're like, oh, this guy's 0 3. He's the guy we should rage at. That's what I'm seeing from this no, Silas no. piling on. <laughs> you're piling on to poor man Silas. Well,. He's a poor man indeed, as he can't seem to find many wins in lane or out, especially in this series. I'm watching you, Valdez. <laughs> <laughs> as, uh, well, poor punch as well. He's going to be spotted here. Hawkshot comes through, and the Ash continues to seem like a pretty good solution to that Lucian that Sandbox essentially gave over to the side of Talmon Gaming. It's one of those things where you say, Lucian, Braum, blind pick, that's really scary. And it surely is. And you don't think of Ash, Tom, Kench as an answer, but the outrange of the extra 100 range on the Ash and her flexibility to trim waves and poke with W or push in if it gets in a bad spot. Uh-oh. Speaking of bad spots, Noggery, of course. Summer gets access to his ultimate first, and Doyen B style just wants to push him out of lane. But uh, the outrange and just how volley works means that a lot of the lane states that Lucian and Braum can punish can actually be answered by good Ash Tom Kench lanes. So while it's not a lane that can win lane hard, it's a lane that doesn't lose really well. So because of that, Ghost actually able to go CS for CS and come the mid game if Ash and Tom Kench are mid lane, we just know the amount of utility that that duo provides is immense. Tons of utility and setup from the bottom lane could definitely unlock some of their more carry-oriented picks in the top lane is Nuggery. Just trying to push this one away with his own Chaos Storm. Will be able to get a very nice back because he pushed it so fast without that teleport. Very much needed that level six. Level six by by here is just going to be a lost chapter. So no indexing into the good old X core here. Seems to be about much more frequent trading. I want to get confirmation of whether it's Q or Emacs. Uh, I would assume Q, given the item build, but not 100% clear on that. Durkun on fleet, comboing. No Abyssal Voyage left just yet. Seems that the Conqueror Jacks will go for what we always see in competitive, but never see solo Q, the Cinder Hulk, and not in fact going for the Devourer Jacks for I Die Instant. It's definitely. Something you want not to die instantly in solo queue and out. So maybe take a page out of this book as Ash against a lane that doesn't have a Braum is doing work here up against the Lucian as very heavy contesting from both teams around an Ocean Drake very early on as they are predicting this laning phase could go on for quite a while. Ocean Drake really high value on both sides, slightly harder because of the Yasuo Arise matchup on the side of Sandbox. And the flag and drag here, Punch notes he's a level ahead right now. I imagine Jax must be very close on experience to level six himself. Doesn't have the same spike, but does of course have a very combat relevant ult. He carries level six, supports level five. A lot of posturing about us, but no action just yet. Sometimes the little trades can make all the difference, though, as with the Jarvan able to get a nice little trade on on fleet, they clear out all that vision. And now both the junglers are hanging around the mid lane, waiting for the action to happen here. Both of them have picked up a red buff, and more importantly, on fleet has picked up level six for the Jack, so he's also ready to go. On fleet knows that because of the ult that Jarvan has, he needs to counter gank mid lane. He saw. The, ja the Javan walk in, so of course he's waiting for the counter game that never came. Speaking of things starting though, down one onto the Drake here. No TP on either top lane, this will be 4v4 if we get a fight. Yeah, it should be 4v4 on Gleek, just gonna run in, trying to burst down Punch, but not quite able to, but still, the fight will come in. And look at on Gleek go, he's going 1v3 for so long, gets devoured in the end of it all. As Punch goes down, Way plus going, the Dragon. Down one. Everybody's caught in the pit, and in goes Jax with the Counter-Strike, picks up a second kill. 
Nice blasting plant, but it may uh -oh. not matter as double ultimate now to get in range as they're just looking for one more kill on the back of this. Should easily be able to pick up point. Three and zero now is on fleet. And man, how many pro players have had to problem solve a way out of that? Well, you have to get over onto the enemy side of the jungle and engineer away as Lucian Braum to escape. There's no two-man escape here, even with the W from the Braum to follow Lucian. Can't get over the wall, but it felt like a firing squad, 4v3 at the end, and it proves to be that. Three kills go the way of Sandbox. We return to the top lane. These guys, unfortunately, not able to join the fight. Maybe it would have looked a bit better for the side of Tom if they did have the victor, but not the way it was meant to be. So many kills now, just accelerate that Dax to new heights in this game. Nobri gets early wave control there because Summit couldn't hijack the ultimate a second time. But now he finally gets it, the cooldown, of course, longer on individuals and their own cooldowns. And he has an Ocean Drake. Let's watch the replay here. To Ghost ult, and this is really smart from Sandbox. You might say, oh, it's just a Fiesta, but consider why the Smite War is won by Sandbox. It's because they all in onto the Jarvan who has to smite not to die. He smites early when it's at 1500 health because otherwise he's going to die. As everything is used to get his health bar down, that means the smite is free. It's always going to be a sandbox win. And then with this map state, there's just no way to honestly escape even though it's a pretty good attempt by yeah, Dumb on Game Studio. Yeah, okay, this is nice and then very good as the coach agrees. Hands up in the air. Huge early lead here for Sandbox now. That fight was crazy, man. It was a, a three-man stun with the Counter-Strike. Instant exhaust onto the Yasuo that got the knockup on the Ash, but it just didn't matter. And as you mentioned before, the Smite's also very important in that one. After the way the early part of that fight went, it was an easy win to the side of Sandbox. This is another one of those Sandbox shock calls. Again, with Joker, the person who they attribute all those shock calls to. There's a lot of trust. You can definitely tell this is a well-oiled machine on the side of Sandbox. They've been rolling with this roster all of spring season and in a scenario like that the call is damage down punch and things will fall in speaking of things falling in joker could be in a bit of trouble here as the knockup comes for showmaker as he will help out in the kill that time around just not going to go the way of sandbox not one nice capitalization but all the while Punch not in position to deny a Rift Herald that goes the way of honor. And they've already lost to Drake on this side. They may outnumber, but Sandbox don't care that you killed a no summoner spell Tom Kench while they got Rift Herald on the other side of the map. They care more about a turret dive or further hurt. Punch is at least posturing, put in some threat, but this still ends up being an overall advantage trade for Sandbox. They take the Rift Herald at the same time, and there's no responding Drake because they just took that as well. Got Infernal in a minute and a half as well. Could definitely see a world where you lay down the Rift Herald right before the plates go down. You create pressure on the map, force Dominant to respond, and then immediately turn onto that tree. It feels like a cost of curse, right? Because we're crediting Sandbox with the Spirit Shaft control calling and map play. They take three members' time to slowly kill a no escape Tom Kench while Onfleet gets Rift Herald. And then they even get better back timing and get some turret plates on the bot side. So they actually end up gold positive if that Rift Herald is used in the next minute or so from the trade. And even if not, they probably get map state positive regardless. So still a great moment. And speaking of map state positive. Well, they're not hiding anything here as it's four on two in the bottom side. Nuclear just going to disappear. And so will Hoyt. The double kill goes the way of the rise and Sandbox continue their lead. The last rights could have been signaled early there for Nuclear and Hoyt. Their death was inevitable. The Rift Herald, let's see if it's even used for a charge here. It probably won't be right. They just take it down and maybe they'll use it for map position and get a 3-0 turret lead like they were able to in an earlier series today. Ghost is going to get the solo gold on the end here. Happy time, 610 gold. Still plenty because the turret plates are still up at 13 minutes 50. That means that Ash is 1,500 gold ahead of Lucian. Ash and Tom Kent's looking pretty damn big here about us. Yeah, I mean, feels good, right? He's 0, zero 5 right now as well. Yeah, as Onfleek never found a time to use that Rift Herald, and now we do have this Infernal Drake and Dom one. They're gonna, they're gonna either live here or die here. It's one last shot for them. As 
So let's see how Sandbox want to approach this. There's actually a deep teleport coming in. They're trying to make a decision oh, to get one. Big stun on Lucid, too. Not able to be stolen this time, but Punch, not all that tanky, is going to nearly go down. Big knockup from the side of Summit, too. Stealing Bronze Ultimate. Now they want to get into the backside. Nice knockup here by Showmaker. In comes the Culling alongside with Chaos Storm doing a ton of poke damage, but it's not enough. As Dove able to flash forward, in goes Joker, too. And it looks like this might be some quick deaths here on the side of Dalmont, but they're looking to turn it around. They dodge the tornado. It goes Summit from behind. Goes a little bit out of position, but the double stun does go the way of On Fleek. Should be the ace, and there it is. Clean one and goes the way of Sandbox. Awesome one to track. They're going to see the rotation. On Fleek somehow doesn't take the Abyss of Voyage. It doesn't <laughs> matter. They pick up the kills here. Dalmont have the right call because Sandbox tries to flank them with two from behind. They try to all in on the front, but. Just like around the Drake, there's no escape for Dumb One Gaming. We're going all the way back. This is a long time ago replay. This is not exciting to talk about. The last rise, like we said, were pulled out very, very early on the play. But it's from here that they're able to just get everything. Here is the ending part. Jax actually uses his flash to get into contest range. It's kind of weird by on fleek. Doesn't get the flash smite. It doesn't really matter though, you understand the lust for the Inferno. The start of it, when they're trying to smash their faces in, because not everyone is shot, is not the biggest. Actually ends up with Damwon finally finding space for Lucian Braum to get the CC off, get the culling off. But as it goes on, you see where the little advantages come in. Really nice re-engage, stops Nuggery in his tracks, and while Damwon have the ability to turn and make this a 3v3, another 3v5 to start, sadly, eventually, it's always inevitably going to be an outnumber, and there's no escape. Really nice follow-up from the side of Sandbox. You can tell they understand when to re-engage. They seem between a couple of different feelings there after they got the kill, but they were talking about Harold and mid lane. Thank you to G-Sun for the confirmation on the Harold part, the mid lane part. It was pretty clear. Turns out Korean comps. We're actually being pretty good at sleuthing them, Valdez. Yeah. We're strong, independent class, don't need no translator. <laughs> Learning as we go, we've heard a lot of them as well, as the games have come along here. And uh, if you had to ask me, I am not happy with Silas riding the bus in this game. You just not knew it was coming though. I knew it was coming, there was no way Silas gonna lose this Did game. he do anything in this game to win? His no. teleport was okay. He did nothing. <laughs> well, you know who relatively will do nothing? May I bring your attention to the difference in 80 carry items? It is a hurricane to nothing on the side of nuclear. Because the Black Cleaver is late. The lane has been heavily won. Ghost and Joker in a honest 2v2, no funny business thing has done just a better job than unfortunately Dom One's duo has been able to. Nuclear hasn't been able to unleash a lot of hurt on this Lucian and Ash Tom Kench. Maybe this is a nice little compositional answer that's better than we expected. We knew it'd be fine. This is more than fine as Punch looking for a play. Trying to all in here onto the Ash, and it looks like nobody's here in position just yet, but Joker eating so much of the damage is going to go down. It doesn't look like the rest of Sandbox can get there in time. Dove can't rotate. The kill does go in. Ghost doesn't have to use a summoner there. Uh, the stacks on the Brom passive falling off as he fell out of the belly actually meant that he was basically safe to kite upwards. The finding another kill, but once again, the only pause is just to kill on Tom Kench. And apart from the Infernal claim, it's the only thing Dom One Gaming have found in this series. Lots of scary score lines for the side of Sandbox. 5-0-1, 3-0-7, and 2-0-6 as Three carries straight in a row, feeling pretty good about their lives right now. And then you try to be glass half full for Damon. Say there's 2,700 gold in bounties right now. Ooh. But now Nogari is flashed. Now you wonder how do they set up that fight that they win? It's a 5 0 Cinder Hulk Triforce Jax. Are you kidding me? He's a Triforce <laughs> ahead of his opponent. Yeah. It's a lot of gold, guys. I, I think it's the most expensive item in the game. Not anymore, but it's, it's up one, there. One of the biggest ones. But uh, yeah, this Jax is so stacked right now. And it's another, a lot of times, slowly killing Joker. The jungle item lead here is the biggest jungle item lead I've seen in a long time. And gonna say this Jax is definitely gonna be putting on the damage numbers you can feel good about. 800 gold bounty from the jungle, not often something you see, but well earned by On Fleek on his famous Jax.
It's he's not scared anymore. Sometimes early on in a Jax's build and life, you need to take it easy in terms of engaging and using that leap strike. But now he's just using it on the first person he sees as he's miles ahead in this one. Already about 8,000 gold ahead is Sandbox, and we haven't even hit 20 minutes in this game, Papa. You just feel like Jax does Jarvan's job better than Jarvan, and he's got damage as well. He can be a frontliner for longer, and he kills you, and that's very scary. And the thing that Jax jungle is always uniquely brought to the game is when you get to late game, Jax is actually very viable in a 1-3-1, one, one, right? The champion is known as the champ. He's known as the ability to just duel out anyone, whether it's a top laner or a jungler, so you just smite the Baron. Uh, control the Elder or have that off the Rift, and then you can be a split pusher, and you can just run at the enemy AD carry, and I don't think an underfed second item Black Cleave Illusion is going to do anything to the champ. So the champ is looking like he's going to live up to his praise in this game, and like you say, Silas might be riding the bus, but uh, he certainly looks like he's going to be winning game number two. Is Whoa, that particle! Follow it! <laughs> Observers, please! Come on! Oh, it looked like Hurricane also, Bolt, here it is. That was the Hurricane Where is Bolt. It? Oh, no, it's too late. Wait, did we miss it? Yeah, that hurricane ball went pretty fast. That's its job to connect with the target. I don't think we've ever followed a hurricane ball before. Auto no, attacks, yeah, yes. That was probably the first time in League history. <laughs> and we missed it. So much for those KR observers, huh? Yep. Apparently. Now, Sandbox are on award, and we wondered how the outnumbering will happen. Ah, Tom Kench and Ash have a lot of utility, so... That one, I see you throwing off your arms. You, you know, champions that are good from ahead, Ash and Tom Cash. Champions that, you know, they win when they're ahead. And Silas. Silas? <laughs> hey, I got to say, you've got to stop dogging Silas. He's a nice guy. No, well, he was a prisoner, right? I, he's, he's freed got, from his chains. He's still got them to his hands. He's got a great sense of humor. I think we should invite Silas to the Cool Kids Club, and you just keep excluding him. I'm, you know. I, I can't plan these social it's be gatherings. A long time. I keep planning them, and you keep telling me, ah, but no Silas. And I'm like, I can't it's, uninvite him. It's definitely one of those things where we're both in the group chat. Yeah. And I'm just like, well, nah, I'm not you're gonna go me if these, he's going to go these. You're know? sending me the DMs being like, does Silas have to be there? And yeah. yes, like, Silas does is we cool. have to bring Silas yes. every time. Yes. <laughs> you need to update your ranking. Silas is here to stay. I know you liked it when Silas wasn't there. It could just be your homeboys. Silas is there now, and that's the new world you live in. Well, he's also another one of these guys where it's like, Victor against Jace, maybe you can get some good action going. Victor against Aurelia, Camille, you know, some of these other carries in the top lane. Silas just builds tanky, half tanky, and sits there and clears waves and says, okay, not much action gonna be happening in the top lane. Right now, it seems like all the action is when Sandbox Dam pleases. They have Control Ward lead around the Baron. They can two-man Baron pretty easily, and they're pretty flexible with who those two men are. As long as Jax is there, he can do a lot of the heavy lifting himself. Already a lot of CDR on the way to counter-striking away. So because of that, and the fact that they have a Roman utility advantage with Tom Kench and Ash, just feels like it's when they damn please that the next move is made. Perhaps an item completion like Infinity Edge or GA from Ghost will be the herald on that. It's going to be the GA, another one of those mid-game closer items. It's been Ghost's way to go on this pick so far today. Silas has some pretty decent shoving ability into the victor and certainly won't be solo kill. Uh, it's not enough gold in Nogari's build just yet. He actually halted his uh, lost out to completion to get the hex core for a bit of utility. And now it's all about throwing flags. We had sad Gragas bowling for a jungler behind on the red side. Now yeah. it's uh, going to have to be... Flag day, Jarvan, just throwing down the flag. That's all he's got. He's like the, sl the the sad school manager that his only job is to raise the flag and then just like... In America, isn't there a dude, flag squad and a cheerleader squad? A flag squad? Yeah, that's like... I'm pretty sure that's a thing. I had to learn about it. It's a very American thing. Uh, Well, not where I'm from. Not in There's New York. There's cheerleaders maybe some, and something else, right? Maybe in some other states. Okay, maybe. Not, not going to name any names. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> Give me a hint. <laughs> Can I buy, buy a clue? Uh, yeah, sure. You want, you want like, a I need a some lifelines over here. <laughs> eh, definitely a couple of states that start with T that uh, definitely are on that bus. As, uh, again, not naming any names. Do you, do you know? How many states do you know? I know a state that starts with T, Tasmania, so. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, okay. That's all I got. I'm Australian, <laughs> by the way.
Wait. State of tarnation. <laughs> well, I mean, so that's, you hear a lot from that's down where Dom One are in right now, but at least it hasn't been smacked in their face just yet. They've been able to joke because the map state hasn't been closed. The game hasn't been closed, even if it feels like a game closing gold lead. Doesn't matter how much you have in theory until you whack him in the face. We remember the wallet. Speaking of whacking him in the face, this is pretty bold. On Link just doesn't care anymore, and he might be paying for it as he goes 1v5. Joker trying to save him gives huh. his life away, and now they might even give him the Baron away. Well, the theoretical advantage is being thrown. Okay, now we're going 3v5, and we're forcing it here as Sandbox, and it nearly works out as they almost kill Nuggery. He has to flash away, but it looks like all the flashes on the side of Sandbox also traded in that effect, but with just that one trade, they may have discouraged the Baron, but it's not going to matter because TP comes in here from Nuggery. Sandbox are still 3v5. Nuggery now is full health. That's why you got to pull the trigger. Let's watch how this one goes. Baron at 5,000. Okay, Cullen comes in. A lot of that stopped by the bra, but now on the backside of the pit, taking a lot of damage. And oh man, Summon and Dump going ham in the backside, but the Baron still will go to the side of Dom1 Gaming just barely as on fleet not there, no chance at a Baron steal. But it's actually a really big contest, Valdez, because they get both side laners. The 1-3-1 one, one can't happen now. TP down on Nogari. Nogari and Showmaker dying and not getting the buff. It means that Dom1 can only play one lane, which does remove a lot of the power of the Baron or have some really weird lane assignments. We already said we'd like Jackson a side lane, Dove and Summit are strong as well. And they find an exit kill here. Doesn't look like on Fleek says he still doesn't care. That time he had a Tom Kent, and it wasn't 1v5. Ghost gonna solo the Drake. Rise pushing the top side for quite a while. Sandbox not too unhappy. Let's see how far uh, Dumb One can make this Baron stretch in terms of coming back in this game. It's just an analysis point that might be lost on some people. How can Sandbox be happy? They lost the Baron. But consider this started with a huge unforced error. That's right there at the tennis column for unforced errors. Jax overrates how strong he is, but more importantly, isn't on the same page as the rest of his team. And that hasn't been a problem for Sandbox. Joker tries to address the spill, but it's a toxic oil spill. It can't actually address it, can't pick anything up. So then it's 3v5. You will lose the Baron. There is no smite here to contest it. But to take down the solo laners is kind of god tier for Sandbox. There's so many different other ways the Baron and contest goes down. Well, they take a one for zero trade and lose the Baron, or it's two for one, and Showmaker or Nogari live. In this case, both of them dying means that Dom1 are only playing one lane with their Baron. That's not what makes Baron shine. That means the Sandbox should be able to survive, and it shouldn't be a game-closing Baron buff power play. Yep, all they can do is sit here in the mid lane when they're still down on gold and try to make the most of the Baron buff that they do not have on their best men. And... Now they're just going to sit here as five. You can see Dove just goes up to the top side. And Summer takes another delaying yeah. ultimate, just throws it out there. They want to buy as much time, see how many objectives they actually lose during this Baron. Remember, they're actually threatening the map yeah. as this plays. They're trading towards against Baron. Hey, trying to force a fight here, though. It's the side of Dom on Joker. is going to bite the dust on Fleek. With a nice stun here, but oh. they get the knock up on the Silas. And oh man, Dom won. The push is coming in as they get two huge picks. But now Showmaker takes a bunch of damage. Oh, flash in from on fleek. He wants to go in and lead his team to the charge. And can Jack's he do alive. it? He gets the first couple of kills and goes his man voting as well. They're going to get another stun on Tanuguri. A double kill to the rise. And Sandbox are here to play. It's only Hoyt left as he's on the run and should be going down in this fight. Oh man, what that, a play. That is the Jax of your nightmares on fleek. Can't do it the first time, but he baited them into a place of safety. 3v5, they all in and kill all five. And Sandbox Gaming, they get over the line, but man, it's been touch and go in the last few minutes. That's just the kind of thing you see and you can understand that on fleek has such a high level of understanding about this champion who's exactly when to go in and engage and lead his team into the charge and tank for the Ash and fight, fight uh, front to back, even down on members. The understanding of the team, or rather the champion and their position in the game is so high from the side of Sandbox and they're gonna turn that into two inhibitors 
after that play. And the thing you must remember about this play, because everyone has their war story of Jax winning a lane he shouldn't and spit pushing and killing your whole team, right? Remember when this play goes on, it's a jungle Jax. And we know the jungle has been nerfed many times over. We see the start of the play, trying to threaten 4v5, but the Yasuo win wall into all in here, kills Silas, and you think they're bones on Flake. The teleport comes in. It might have even not come in if they'd rushed down the turret, but they can't. But Omvik re-engages as Jungle Jax for a three-man counter-strike, and all the gold on a jungler is often the reason why you at least got all the gold. You at least didn't got all the gold. Your carries are behind. He's a jungle carry. Is Jungle Jax, and the fact that he can do this on the jungle in a pro game is something we so rarely see, and that's why it's a treat to watch him roll in there and rise and Jax, tanky boys that do a lot of damage roll through the members of Damwon Gaming. Everybody loves to talk about the, the big junglers up towards the top. They always mention, you know, Clid and uh, Tarzan, obviously, but Unfleek sometimes loves to slide under the radar in some of the fans' minds, but hopefully after this game, he can shoot right back up there towards the top. Definitely a very highly mechanically skilled and has a huge understanding of the game, as you guys can see. Summit gonna throw out that Chaos Storm and nearly die, if not for the Tom Kent who's there in position. Actually pretty clean by Nuclear, got a big chunk onto Summit, but not gonna be the biggest thing. Double Ocean gonna be helpful, you can see the health bars. Starting to roll up, it was as rises in the mid lanes, trying to make them punished, but trying to play two lanes. Summit can do a lot of thrift shopping now, he's level 16. Back to the Brahm ultimate. On fake, and we talked about that lane assignment with a jungler like Jax. You can play three lanes with your smite user, so on fake pushes top. In the mid lane, they just want to catch Braum. Yeah, Rise now, you know, we're talking about some of the other members, but take a look at his damage. Arrow perfectly on point there. Not much of an escape this time around for Hoy. Says in goes Summit, has the Jarvan Cataclysm. Says hello to the face of Dom1 Gaming. In goes on Fleek into the back. He's got a Guardian Angel now. As Summit also trying to lead the charge, is going to go down here. But Dove will be there on cleanup duty as Sandbox trying to push in for the win. Sandbox going to close the game here. Nothing Nuclear can do. Punch comes in. One way trip to the death chamber. And Sandbox Gaming will stop Dom One's win streak at six. Very impressive game here. Sandbox from ahead, finally able to close it out here. GG in about 33 minutes, I suppose. Big tears all around to the side of Sandbox, who will once again take a 2-1 victory over Dom1. Champ giveth, the champ taketh away. The one-way trip to the death chamber was how Dom1 got the Baron, but contesting and getting a two-for-one, but importantly, forcing Dom1 to only play one lane is why they don't, weren't just paper cut to death from multiple directions against Baron if Yasuo and Victor have it. You can't have that lane assignment. And yes, it took a huge re-engage on the champ, actually hard carrying, for it to matter anyway, but if your side laners have Baron, that play never happens, this analysis never happens, and they find a way to break the base. Instead, Sandbox get the re-engage, on fleek acceptance, and they get to bow to the crowd, lol park, and their appreciation for Sandbox to cement their spot two series ahead of Damwon, and closer and closer to outright second in the LCK. Really trying to make a case to bring back some of the fans and the non-believers after their slow tapering off here in the middle of spring 2019, but they fight back here in a super impressive game. On Fleek reminds you, hey, I don't just play Lee Sin, I don't just play Rek'Sai, Camille, Olaf, I can also play Jax as he widens his pool. Once again, it'll be interesting to see who picks up that MVP, I think On Fleek. Well, whatever. Kind of an obvious one there, Ghost. Some really nice mechanics as well after On Fleek was opening up some of those traits. So shout out to him too. I think On Fleek will probably have the most gold on a jungler all season in this game. He was so fed and farmed and also just everything going his way by the end. So my imagination is that he should be saluted for that play. But everyone played their part. Ghost, like you say, was so solid on the Ash. Another pick now that's in his effective champion. Well, it's not just, ooh, don't know about Ghost on that pick. It's, all right, his Ash is good. He's right up there with Sung Yoon and some of our better Ash players. 2-0 now. In the league, exactly. 2-0 only on today. Another new pick in the 9.4 cycle. And on a patch cycle that we think will extend crit carries for a long time, he plays the Ash. That part is confirmed. Big smiles from Joker. Well-deserved victory for Sandbox Gaming. So we got some orders of business before our second series. We go the full three, and I think just the 
more solid nature of the five members of Sandbox was to me the biggest takeaway between the two teams. They were swapping Silas priority and there were some unexpected mistakes from uh, Sandbox Gaming in game number three and some expected anticipated mistakes from Sandbox. So at the end of the day, a dumb one I should say. So at the end of the day, it's not the biggest difference in the two teams, but I came in being 60-40 Sandbox and I leave being 60-40 Sandbox. So Damon Gaming need to retool if they're going to be able to take down a team like Sandbox Gaming in a best of five. That's going to be almost a guaranteed roadblock if they are to ascend up the standings in playoffs. Sandbox after that win, as you mentioned, they do claim second place ahead of SKT. Damon now eight and five. I believe they might be. Let me take a look here. Well, King Zone seven and five alongside Hanwa. So if King Zone or Hanwa take a win, you could see Dom One begin to slide down in some of the rankings, which is not where you want to be when especially these top six teams in the LCK Spring right now are really vying for only five spots. Every game matters. And it is worth noting that Sandbox only moved plus one ahead of SKT with one more match play. They don't move to 13. They came in at plus 11. Guys, if you're wondering about LCK, tiebreaker rules, obviously it's match score first, so best of three wins. After that, it's game score. So it's game wins over game losses, then it's head-to-head. -head. So Sandbox, as of now, own the head-to-head -head against SKT by beating them in the first round, Robin, and their game score has gone down a little bit. So because of that, it isn't extending a huge lead, but Dunwon are not an easy team to 2-0. And of course, SKT will face Sandbox after, or much after, they actually play against Griffin tomorrow, where their game score might be rescued or maybe further hurt. Take a look at some of the highlights here of game number one. This was the second Baron, the Infernal. That's a nice little flank from Summit, gets this one started. Was pretty competitive in this series. This was where Sandbox were slight leaders uh, towards the mid-game before the big over-engage from the champ, where he overrated his power and just went in too early. This is where they were able to surround and eventually take down most of the members of Damwon. A spirited escape from Nuclear does get him clear of the clutches of many, many people. I believe in this fight, but this might have actually been one of the wipes. It was so extended, right? There were so many fights where it felt like there was a surround and no Nuclear went down. This would, of course, be after the earlier contest around the Drake. But a lot of fights here. This is where Onflick threw one back. Goes in. He actually doesn't have Counter-Strike at the start. He's trying to hold on to it and just gets four hit passive by Braum and goes down. So that was a mistake by the man who ended up being the carry. But here where they specifically got both side laners, it got some breathing room. And then the champ did the rest in a 3v5. Summon and Dove, when you are just attacking singular targets right in front of them, can do some insane damage, as we did see in that one. But this re-engage is where Onfleek makes up for his earlier mistake. Says, hey, Showmaker Nuclear got a little bit too far forward here. Let us try to go back in. And that he does. With the big stun comes in, creates so much space for the two carries of Dove and Ghost to do all that damage as he hides back in his stopwatch. Really entertaining series, you know. We've had a lot of matches that we hyped up based on previous games, based on ladder standings, and then the actual game has been, you know, a bit iffy. A couple of stinkers, a couple of easy 2 zeros. A lot of teams that we hyped against SKT have rolled over. Griffin have beaten all their opposition. It's good to see some competition, because I leave this series being like, wow, there could be a great best of five between these teams, because Okay, down one lose here. Let's bring back Flame. Let's see how that goes, right? Down one have the bench to make best of fives interesting. So maybe we will be treated to one of those at some point in the 2019 season. Right now we're treated to on fleek and the tanky DPS members of Sandbox closing out game number three. Probably an interesting interview with Minna Kim after we get the big numbers on the screen. And the Jax did about, I mean, it was, more than double over the Jarvan, of course. And you can see Victor did have a big damage number, but unfortunately that wasn't able to carry them to a victory or do much of anything. It was really just the Silas and the Jax opening up some of those fights for the Ash and the Rise to just rain down hell from right behind them. And when you're ahead, that certainly works out. And it also shows us Punch has to go in the extended bag after so many jungle bans by Dumb One. He power picks Jarvan. Onflake's got his old faithful, the Jax, to fall back to and conquer a Jax. 
Trinity Force too early. And from there, the game closed out. So really well played by Onflake in a trying situation. The jungle champion pool was the Drakes. Yeah, there's tons of bands that came out. We saw Olaf, Lee Sin, and Nocturne, Gragas, Sejuani all taken away. But Onflake goes down to the Dax, 8, 1, and 5. Will easily pick up the MVP of this game. Watch some of those highlights here. I wonder if we'll show the Jax low light in the highlight package, but we saw all these because they were the big moments of the game. We skip over the low light for the 3v5. To know and understand the damage ranges here is so important for Hurricane Ash. The Rise doesn't do too much because he has the stasis and gets stunned up by the W. Jax is so immovable and has so much chase potential when you're hitting close to 40% CDR and level 18. Chase, 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 jump on towards, jump on to champions, whatever he can jump onto. He knew there were kills to fall. Definitely did his job very well, especially after that immaculate early game where he picked up three kills around that first Drake. So all kind of snowballed from there and Sandbox do end up our winners. Let's hear from them in the interview. I'll hand it over to Jisa. Today's interview translation. And we're going to be joined by Joker and Onflake from Sandbox Gaming. Joker, it's your first MVP interview. Good to have you here. How do you feel? I thought the time will come, but I didn't expect this will be today. Especially really happy that we pick up a 2-1 two, oh, uh, victory against Summon Gaming. Well, weren't you really sad that you missed so many MVPs? Kind of? But, but I feel happy, and that's what matters more when I win every match, so I wasn't really that sad. And on fleek, Game 3, your Jax was unstoppable. How do you feel right now? Today was a very significant day for us. I'm really happy that to take down the strong team Palmon Gaming today. Game 1, I want to talk about the draft. It was a very early pick, Braum, as a supporter. During the screens, I thought Braum is a very high tier champion, so I thought it's kind of worth to pick it in the early phase of picking bands. Was that your own idea? I wanted Braum, and all the teammates also wanted Braum, so that's why we played Braum today. And after you picked Brown, actually, Talmud Gaming picked two Molo champions, so did you think that you won the draft? In terms of game one, I thought that we gained the momentum in the, about the mid game. And game two, there was a big team fight in the end. So I thought we were able to win the game, but we actually, uh, uh, Talmud Gaming was able to turn the game around in game two, and we lost the game. And let's check out this replay over here. I want to see Joker's reaction. Because it was actually uh, for like a 4v3, so... Weren't you really worried? Well, actually, uh, my damage dealers were in a good position to put damage, so we I knew that we were going to win. So I told my teammates that I might get cut out, so I made calls to come back me up, and they were all the teammates in my back to kind of fight back. Moving on to game three on Fleek. You had a very early Triforce and you carried the game, so was Jax prepared in beforehand? Well, Jax, I mean, it's one of the picks that I can always play in the right situation. So this is a highlight. On flick. There was a great flank over there. But I actually expected the uh, team fight near the water drain. Uh, the, uh, the ocean drain. I'm a bit confused over here. Well, but anyways, this is this was a big play on Sandbox Gaming side. 
So we just pushed lane and Ash was facing and we were trying to open team fight. And we were ready for a team fight but we had some items and I wanted them to start uh, the dragon and they actually did so I knew that we were going to win the game. What about the last team fight? Well, I mean, I made too many mistakes, so I want to make it up to my teammates. So maybe that was why I was able to do well at that moment. Joker, I have heard that you are the main shot caller in your team. Do a lot of coaching staff trust you? Yeah, they always trust me in terms of pick and ban and also in terms of play. So maybe that kind of makes me a little bit more confident. Same goes to me. Um, we're always getting good results, so I like the system right now. And your next opponent will be Griffin. How are you going to prepare for it? Well, I actually feel like I just want to show great games to the fans because it's a really the most strongest team in LCK. So I just want to see some entertaining and exciting game for the LCK fans. What about you, Onflick? Even though we might lose, I hope we can learn a lot. But I hope you guys can pick up that win in your pocket. And this will wrap up today's interview with Joker and Onflick from Sandbox Gaming. And I'm going to pass it back to our casters. Thank you. Thank you, Jisun, for helping out with that translation as on fleek, very modest, says, I hope we can learn a lot from Griffin. That matchup will be on Sunday night, will be the second matchup. Uh, should be brought to you by LS and Atlas, that one. So it should be pretty exciting. And you guys can see the, n the current standings after this one. Sandbox do take second place. Dom one remain in fourth. And I want to draw your attention to matches played. Sandbox get to 10 match wins, same as Griffin, but they've played three more series. So Griffin could definitely end up 13-0 after the next few series, but it's against SKT, who has been able to work out some of their kinks recently. Sandbox are in a lot of form as well. If you upset Griffin tomorrow and SKT, with how they've been playing recently, they could actually play like that against Griffin. Who's to say they can't find a match victory there somewhere? Then it's the perfect time for Sandbox to swoop, right? Because they've played themselves into great form, and the schedule is counted against Griffin. But guys, speaking of schedules, about a 30-minute break before we get our second series. Yeah, shouldn't be too long after that one. We'll see how it can go in the next one, which will be Jin Air up against Afrika.